Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming out today as part of the uh, Imagine Festival. Um, first, I, I want to uh, give thanks to the Community Relations Council, who have kindly provided us some financial support for this event, um, with the objectives of informing the public about our podcast, uh, Shared Future News, called Northern Peace Builders, to demonstrate the importance of the values of respect, inclusion, and diversity, and to engage uh, the public and yourselves with the work of peace building. My name is Alan Leonard. I'm the managing editor of Shared Future News, which is an online publication of news and stories of peace building in and about Northern Ireland. Um, we Shared Future News really began about 2008 as part of another project. And we work uh, with uh, volunteers and others covering events uh, interviewing people, doing book reviews, producing podcasts, and just basically trying to spread the word out about peace building um, in Northern Ireland. Um, at this time, I also want to um, thank the Imagine Festival for hosting uh, the event for us and encourage you, if you haven't already, to uh, look and attend uh, other, other events. Um, so tonight, what we have are a panel of guests of peace builders uh, from Northern Ireland, well, in Northern Ireland. Um, and they have all been interviewed by myself uh, for our podcast, Northern Peace Builders. And their episodes are all available now on our website and on uh, podcasting uh, platforms. What I'd like to do is just to give you a, a flavor, is to introduce, um, just give you a short bio on, on, on each. So I'll work from uh, my far right to my far left, and starting with uh, Jared Dean. So Jared was born uh, into the vocation of community relations in that his father, Eamon Dean, is known for his work in the Bogside Community Association and Youthways uh, in Derry, Londonderry. Um, Jared's father, Eamon, also established Hollywell Trust. So Jared strongly values the role of building relationships and became committed to the place he grew up in. This included his decision to study peace and conflict studies for a degree at Ulster University at McGee. His objective for his work at Holywell Trust and with partner organizations is to be seen as a trusted broker to facilitate constructive conversations. Jared has worked at Holywell Trust since 2004, where he is director. To Jared's left is Michael Doherty, Michael's first job was in a barber shop. Deciding not to become a barber, his story is a journey into youth work via music. He worked full time as a community relations worker for the Northern Ireland Association Youth Clubs, now known as Youth Action. Michael, with others, designed the first ever training program for community relations work in 1988 and subsequently developed it further. His work in mediation was accredited accelerated after an intensive course at Fordham Law School in 1996. The next year he was providing mediation services for the Parades Commission in Northern Ireland. Michael is passionate about the need to address sectarianism directly. He is currently based in Mediate Northern Ireland in Derry, London, Derry. To Michael's left is a Dipna McGlade. Dipna grew up during the civil rights campaign in Northern Ireland. After returning from studies in England, her first job in community relations was at Belfast City Council working in Divis and then Ardoin and, and Antrim. She was policy director at the Community Relations Council, motivated to bring evidence to policymaking as well as to community development. Dipna continues to be a social justice activist in, voluntary, in a voluntary capacity with a number of organizations. And finally, to my immediate right is David Robinson. <clears throat> Raised in Southern Ireland, David first became conscious of the fractured politics on the island during the hunger strikes. This sparked his interest in the history and political situation on the island and through becoming community aware, he became active in his local community in Bray, volunteering with youth projects and the parish. On leaving school, David applied to become a religious teacher 
as well as applying to become a priest. He went the priestly route initially, and during his time at the seminary, he encountered Coramila, where he later spent four years becoming a youth development worker there. In 2006, he began working for Belfast City Council, where he is a community relations officer. So thank you all very much, and I hope that gives you a flavor of who we're speaking with tonight. And I'd mentioned in those introductions some of the, some of the, the uh, backgrounds, uh, their personal backgrounds, and what I found intriguing was that some spoke about being born into it or being exposed to community issues uh, at a very young age, whereas others it was more of a evolution growing up and exploring, you know, perhaps that, that community peace building would be something for them. So, for example, Dipna, when I asked you, you said you were, quote, born into it. You don't need to adjust, it should be, should be fine. The mic should be fine. Um, you said you were, quote, born, born into it, um, and that your parents were, were, were very, very active. Can you, like, briefly describe, like, your, when we sometimes we speak about our first memories, you know, and I'm just wondering what some of your first memories were um, in this regard. Okay. Um, when I say born into it, so picture this, May 1957, Mater Hospital, North Belfast, my father, my mother was in labour, and my father snuck in because he was on the run, he was a Republican, and said to my mother, I was the youngest of five, three brothers and one sister, and he said, I hope it's a pinky, a girl, and it was, it was me, and off he went, and he got caught. So he'd done three years. I didn't see him for three years. Um, he it, it never got charged with anything. It was at Her Majesty's pleasure. Um, and then it, it, they were already in a ceasefire, the IRA, in 1963. Um, they went into civil rights. My mother and father went into civil rights and joined with trade unionists and communists and um, unionists and republicans to form the Civil Rights Association. And then I was a very young child and I remember people coming to and from the house discussing politics and social justice for Catholics and Protestants. So I was born into it, grew up with it, and my natural instinct whenever I became an age when I was starting to think about what I wanted to do was to go into community development and community relations. And Jared, when I spoke with you, you also said that you know, I introduced you about your father and that you were constantly kind of exposed to it. Um, so like, what were some of your like early memories? I asked you about an event and you didn't remember any particular event, but, but you, you know, at such a young age, uh, you know, did, did you feel like different than other children, um, you know, being dragged to, to all of these type of events? So, Michael? Uh, no, it's all my dad's fault. Uh, let's be really honest about it. I can't remember any one event where it was like, hey, we have to go here because all the Protestants are gathering and we have to go and meet them. It wasn't like that. It was just, I grew up meeting a different range of people than I normally would have. It's like you normally, given the nature of society, you don't meet anybody from the other background until you go to university. But that wasn't the case for me and it wasn't the case for Michael and his children either because we were dragged along often. They, they go to the events, um, and you just get to know people as people. You don't get to know them as the labels that they're, they're hanging off them. So that's more normal. That's the way it should be. But your day-to-day -day is different. Your day-to-day -day is apart, and, and that's the, the reality of it. And that was one of the reasons that I said, no, this isn't normal. This isn't natural. I need to commit to doing something that wee bit different, and that's why I try to do it. I don't know how successful it's been because we're still a very divided society. <laughs> Michael, I remember you telling me um, that you assisted your father in the barber shop, and you had all sorts of clients. So I mean, I'm just I'm back of Jared's like, you know, his his exposure with his parents was mixing, but then he realized outside that family circle that that wasn't normal. So like in your case, I remember you telling me about helping out in your father's barber, and you had all sorts of clients. <laughs> well, what happened was... Michael, can you hold the, the mic up? What happened was in the 1960s, or during the 1960s, there was very little work in the city, Derry. And my father was an alcoholic, and he went dry. And after a couple of years, he took out a full-time job as a barber, looking after a, a shop on behalf of another barber. But he brought me along out of school. I was out of school when I was 14. 
and I got involved in a situation whereby, like Jared, I got to know a lot of Protestants through the practicality of working in the barber shop. But, it, but during that period, it was getting near the time. And if you look at the age of me, I could have been Jared's father, because I'm the same age as his father. Uh, we were caught up in a situation whereby we were looking for a house. And when you look at the housing situation back at then, they weren't building any houses. So I got caught up on the 5th of October 1968 in Duke Street when the first civil rights march was battened by the RUC at that particular point in time. And our shop was used to uh, cure the wounds of some of the people who were their heads with the toils from the barber shop. So that was my real experience of getting involved working with people from the other side of the community in a particular area of the city that was completely divided. So that was my first venture on the meeting people in that capacity. And and David, your your story to me really sticks out because um, you grew up down south um, in Bray, which I know, County Wicklow, um, and it was it seemed to be more just overt politics. Where you're telling me about getting collared into some some work, and for much of our interview, I was like, this could be a story about you know someone who got involved in. Southern politics, became a Southern priest, became a Southern history teacher, uh, maybe a Southern peace builder. Um, so but tell, tell me more about um, getting collared into the politics work and your interest in Irish history, just at a young age. I'm yeah, speaking, gosh. At a young age. Um, so I suppose uh, sometimes I'm not really comfortable with the term peace builder. I don't, okay. I sort of don't see myself as a peace builder. I sort of see myself on a journey, um, if that makes sense. Um, and growing up at home, um, I think my, my grandfather was was a, was a big influence on me um, in the sense of whenever Ian Paisley or Margaret Thatcher would come on the telly, so you're talking about the early 80s, he would have just turned the TV off. So if there was a news item, he just turned the telly off and he'd sit down with a big grump on his face. And I, and, and I, I was curious, why was, what's going on, what's he doing? And then I remember the time of the hunger strikes in the estate where we lived in Old Court Estate. Um, shout out to Katie Taylor, who's from Old Court as well. Um, whenever the, 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 the black flags going up and the people wearing the black armbands, and I was only about seven or eight at the time, but it, it, started, it aroused a curiosity in me that, I, that, I, um, that stayed with me. I started to want to find out more. I started to ask questions, and nobody had any answers. Nobody, the reaction in many cases was just, ah, they're all just fighting among themselves up there. That was generally the, 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 the answer. So, but I, but I sort of started to get into history and started to read about it and politics and, and whenever I was in school. And like, like, like what Dimpen was saying, you know, whenever you come to the age where you have to decide what you're doing with your life. I suppose for me, there was something in the back of my head that meant I need to explore this further. Um, and, and I remember the, uh, the, the 1990 presidential election in the South um, that Mary Robinson won. Um, but Brian Lenahan, do you remember Brian Lenahan was the candidate for Fianna Fáil and our local councillor, Joe Behan, was uh, going around canvassing on the doors. I says, Joe, I'm only 17, I can't vote. And he said, would you vote for Brian? I said, absolutely. Give that guy a chance. He's served his country. He's done a lot. And Joe said, stick your coat on and come on out with me and uh, tell the people around the doors why you would vote for him. So that was the start of getting involved more polit politics with a, with, a, with, a more, with a bigger P. Mm -hmm. um, and through that, uh, I suppose, Fianna Fáil called itself the Republican, still calls itself the Republican Party. And... The Irish question, the constitutional question, the big politics on the island was something that just I was fascinated by, really interested in, I wanted to find out more about. But you didn't, I want to carry on with you here, because you didn't, you didn't go into politics though, you, you said that you wanted to um, get involved in religion or religious studies because you wanted to help, you wanted to help, yeah. right? So um, why religion and not politics? I suppose, Politics in, 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 in the South for a young person like me from, a, from a, a, an estate that I, that, that, that I grew up in probably wasn't really a, a career option. Um, 
you know, people were people were, were activists, and there was also it was a bit of a closed shop as well in terms of you know if you were running if you were in one of the main political parties, it was a bit of a closed shop. You were never going to really make a career out of it. Even with Brian Lenehan as your friend. You were Brian, poor old Brian, <laughs> and uh, so. Um, but for me, I was involved in the community, in the parish, as you said, in the intro, I was involved in community work, mm -hmm. summer schemes, and my mom was a huge influence, that on me. She got us involved in the, as junior leaders in the summer schemes, and she, she, was, uh, she was involved in the girl guides, she was involved in all sorts of things. She was involved in everything but the crib, they used to say. Um, and, and I sort of took that on a bit as well. I got involved in all of that, and I was involved with some of the stuff in the parish. And, and the, the whole notion of wanting to do something good, but feeling this sense of the religious part of my brain going, you know, you're going to have to try this or you'll regret it, you're going to have, you know, that sort of in your shoulder. Yeah. So I applied to seminary and I applied to be a religion teacher. I made a deal with God. I said, look, if I'll play for both and whatever I get, I'll go and give it a shot at. But I got both of them offered and then I decided in the end, well, if I don't do the priest thing and I became a teacher, I'll probably be sitting there as a teacher regretting why I didn't do that. Yeah. So, so that, but, but that, you see, when you look back on your life and your journey, that decision was crucial in ending up up here and ending up coming that's, across Corrymeela. <clears throat> no, that's, that's right. I was just going to ask you about that. Uh, just to fast forward a little bit, uh, that remarkable, you have to listen to the podcast episode to get the full story, but that, that remarkable kind of uh, like transformation, really, of, of how, I don't say serendipity, but you know, the, 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 you know, the, the way it came out that it was kind of a good, uh, a good opening for you in the sense that it kept you true to maybe that religious devotion you had, but you could, if, if you maybe, you could see how you could apply it by discovering Coramila, being yeah. introduced to Coramila. Yeah. yeah, and so I spent four years in the seminary, um, but there was always again and I was, I was still going to Fianna Fáil meetings and stuff like that, which I wasn't allowed to do. And, but, but I was, I was, uh, I was, I, I, I love being Irish, right? I love, I love, I just love being, being Irish. I love this island. Uh, and I suppose the Corrymeela, the, the, the way into Corrymeela for me was that outlet for me to be able to try and do something um, uh, constructive in terms of, the, the, the constitutional stuff, the mm -hmm. peace building stuff, the reconciliation stuff. And so when I decided to apply to Caramela, it was a total accident. Um, we, we, our class came up the north and it was my first time ever across the border. We were in Porta Ferry and this would have been about 1994, 95. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and things were still happening, but the, 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 the ceasefires were, 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 were on the edge, were on the, were on the verge of, of happening. Um, and we were curious. And we came up and we spent a weekend here, but one of the, just uh, by pure chance, the, the guy who was our class priest, Gareth Byrne, uh, one of his classmates from when he was in the college in the seminary was a, was a man called Father Alan Hilliard. And Alan Hilliard's um, sister-in-law was Paula Heavey Hilliard, who uh, introduced us to Alison Morrow, um, uh, who's a sister of Duncan. And she met us when we were on our class weekend away. Uh, and she met us on the Shankill Road in a coffee shop. Uh, when the flags were up, the murals were up, the curb stones were there, and I was cacking it. And I found myself being fascinated, scared, but curious. Mm -hmm. And it was those sort of things, I think, that led me, uh, whenever I decided to take a year out, I wanted to find out more about Corrymeela, because she gave us a fantastic you rundown did. of you it. You did. Whereas, um, Dipna, your, your kind of um, journey uh, in, into peace building or active community relations work. Um, you went to university for studies and then you came back and, and uh, your first job, you I think said, quote, was a baptism of fire because you were in the thick of it. And so in contrast to, um, uh, to David's kind of journey of discovery, um, you were just thrown right in the thick of it. Can you describe a little bit about that kind of, you know, you, 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 you went to university to study, and then it wasn't very long before you were really, really in the thick of it. Yeah, I'd gone to university for three years in Birmingham. And when I come back, I thought, oh, I'd, I'd need to just take it easy and get back into the way of things. It, it was early 80s, um, and things were pretty bad. And I thought, I'll get the lay of the land and, and just wait and see. 
But a job came up very quickly and I got offered a job in Divis Flats. I don't know if any of you remember the flats um, in Divis with full redevelopment. And I thought, well, not many jobs coming up, I'm just, I'll, I'll take it. So I got back into community work then, uh, straight into Divis. And I didn't realise at the time that it was probably the worst place in Europe to be working in relation to, to conflict. Um, so I, I took it as normal. I thought, well, everywhere must be like this. But there were, the, the British Army were on the top of the Divis Tower. Um, there were pogroms going on in Divis between different Republican factions. There were also murders going on in and around the city centre, um, loyalist murders on Catholics. So there was everything going on. Um, and everybody was fighting with everybody and fighting very violently. Um, there was guns all around the place and there was kneecappings and there was murders. Uh, the army used to deliver their, um, the, the food and I don't know what else, but by helicopter, can you imagine, in a, a built-up area like Divis, they came down in a helicopter and lowered onto the top of the Divis Tower the supplies. Everything blew, <laughs> the kids. Sometimes the army uniforms, so the underwear and stuff would be blown over. The kids would be running about with them as trophies. But So I worked there for five years thinking, this is life here. And then I, I was a, a part-time, I was the assistant community worker to a wonderful man called Jerry Downs. Um, he was a, a trade unionist and had come through community work just not through, it was experience rather than qualifications but a brilliant mentor, he was just a man of the people. So, but I got offered a job then as the community worker in charge in Ardoin and thought, right, I'll go there. And when I went to Ardoin, I thought, this is easy. After being in Divis, I didn't realize Divis was so bad till I went to Ardoin. Everybody thinks Ardoin was bad. I'm from not too far from there. But after that, everything was easy. I thought, well, that was, as you say, a baptism of fire. Um, I was able to cope with anything that was thrown my way. And it, it was difficult times, you know, you, you had to confront lots of different people. Um, I worked for the Belfast City Council, like David, and your, your employers are the councillors. And at that time, there was no common agreements between councillors. So we're trying to keep the local Republicans from putting the tricolour on the community centre because it put the workers at risk of drive-by shootings. And you were also trying to work with them without the councillors fighting out. You were working with Republicans. You know, it was just... And then you were trying to do uh, community work across the divide with the local Woodville on Shankill Road um, in Glenbrun. It was just chaos. But yeah, after coming from Divis, it was dead easy. <laughs> it wasn't really, but it was far easier than Divis. <laughs> when I look back on it, I'm actually very grateful to have worked there. Um, it, it taught me a lot, mm. the hard way. <laughs> so, so, um, so, Michael, how, how easy or difficult was it for you then, uh, your work for the Parades Commission? You had explained that after taking a course at the Fordham Law School in 96, and you, you, know, you learned some, some new theories of mediation, you came back. It wasn't long after you returned, I believe, it was about 1997 where you were working with the Praise Commission. And so your profession is mediation. So if you can kind of share um, sort of the things that you learned pretty quick, you know, the things that you were taught, and then you came back, put some things into practice, and you're like, oh, maybe, maybe there's another way of looking at this. Oh, what happened was we were taught by a lot of American mediators at Fordham Law School. And what I discovered was that there were three particular models of mediation. Michael. One was called evaluative mediation, one was called facilitative mediation, and the other was shuttle mediation. And what I realized whenever we came back and started to work here, the Freight Commission was set up in 1997, but they really didn't become into operation until 1998. But we were authorized officers of the Freight Commission, and our task was to go out and try to mediate disputes between the loyal orders and residence groups to see what with anything, accommodations could be worked out. But what I discovered was in some of the earlier days that we were using an evaluative model of mediation, and that was a model whereby the, the mediator could give advice to the parties, but it, the onus was on the parties to accept or reject the advice that was being given, but they had to take ownership of the outcome. 
Well, what happened was whenever the parades issue was going belly up, the mediators were actually getting blamed for it. And I began to realise we're using the wrong model. We should be using a more facilitative model. And that model is very clearly saying you take a parties through a process whereby they can reach an accommodation without you giving any sort of advice whatsoever. So you had to learn a whole new language of doing that, such as, well, what, do you, what way do you think this should work out for you? What would make it better for you? Without telling them, if you did this, this is what should happen. So we, I worked in that arena very clearly for a lot of years, and I've helped work behind the scenes using that particular model uh, of not giving advice. The other model was shuttle mediation, whereby the mediators were trusted to take communication back and forward. And in that, a guy called John Paul Lederach would have titled me as being an insider parcel. And that was somebody coming from one side of the community but was trusted to work on the other side of the community. And that happened for a lot of years as well. Now, it's got to the stage now where a lot of the praise issues have been settled through different forms of mediation and different contacts have been made. Now, it's not over by any stretch of the imagination, but compared to what it was years ago, it's a lot better now than what it was. No, that's, and I think that's a, a good lesson to show that whatever you, you learn formally when you're in practice, you need to look and think of your options and, and be open to deploying them as the, as the situation presents itself. So, Jared, I know you had, uh, like when we spoke, you um, had a, a bad experience, I think it's fair to say, with your first degree, um, um, though you have had kind things to say about the, the Hamber Kelly there is a reconciliation of the five strands. But I think what I'd like to, for you to share is just about this, uh, I don't want to say frustration, but um, the importance of the relationship, say, between whatever academic theories on peace building and reconciliation are being developed and then w what you're actually doing on the ground. Uh, you can't say frustration. That's fine. I'm completely, I was completely frustrated. <laughs> uh, my situation was whenever I was finishing up at school, um, the majority of the people in my year were all deciding, it's either here at Queen's or I'm away altogether. Very few people decided to stay in the city. And I did. I decided to stay and go to what was at the time University of Ulster and study peace and conflict studies because I wanted to do community relations work, I wanted to do community development work, and I thought, right, I needed solid grounding in this. And at the time, it was still an act of conflict. So I thought, Jesus, be a really brilliant learning experience. And, you know, what better way? They're bound to have loads of practitioners on and all, and we'll get to practice the theory. And that was the furthest thing from the truth. The reality was that we looked at the Irish problem, to give it a term, uh, up until about 1992, 93. So, and there might have been a passing remark, like I, the Tamil Tigers, they're kind of like the IRA, and you're like, oh, jeez. So it was a huge must opportunity. I stayed here to get the insight, to get the, you know, to show my commitment to the place for one, but also to say, we have as much to teach as we do um, to learn from other places. And my frustration was that, no, that wasn't the practical reality. It, it was like, you're looking at just war theories from you know, back in the 50s or 40s or whenever the hell that was. I've blanked it out of my mind, so I could be entirely wrong here. Um, but you know, the theory and the practice piece, Michael talks about the theory, and, and I've done Michael's training, and it's brilliant, and it is a lot more relevant than some of the peace and conflict stuff I did. It was more or less a history degree. It wasn't like, and they used this grand theory of peace building in order to solve the issue. No, yes. it wasn't. It was like they brought this boy in, and he had to have everybody. It was grand. Because, Steph, now you had, I remember, you, you, in, you spoke about getting involved um, in policy for the Community Relations Council. You described about wanting to put experiences and try to implement that into policy. Can you like elaborate a little bit more on that? Uh, let me put it another way. Did you apply anything that you learned at university into your practice? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. Then how did you develop the practice then, the policy? At, at university, yeah, you, you learn certain things um, like trigger names and what have you that you're supposed to rehearse. But quite honestly, 
I don't know about anywhere else where there wasn't the conflict going on, but yeah. dealing on conflict situation, you learn on your feet. You kind of, the university grounds you in as much as you've made your mind up, you want to do this work. So you come away thinking, yes, definitely, that's my chosen career. But then a plan to what you're learning has been, it, it doesn't, you, it, no, it, you can't really, not mm -hmm. in conflict situation when you're dealing with things, the unexpected, and you have to be aware of lots of, uh, you have to be open to meeting people that you are basically at odds with, mm -hmm. um, with your opinion and everything else. You have to be open and keep working with people you don't necessarily agree with, but you, ha you know you have to do that in order to try and unite people and move forward and find that common ground. You might never change people's minds, but to try and get people to live together, to be compassionate towards each other, that's, you can't learn that in university. It's, as I say, I'm not sure if, it's, if you can do it where there isn't conflict, but where there's conflict, I think it's an entirely different learning. And people like Michael coming along, who's actually self-taught almost, if you like, with the, the conflict resolution and the mediation from what you learned, that's more important. And the skills you learn there, and the understanding you get um, by working with people, by being open to hearing their opinions even though you disagree, that's something that you just develop yourself. Mm -hmm. And then helping to marry people up so they can learn from each other. But yeah, the university, I don't know, uh, wouldn't be unkind. It's very important to have a qualification and some training, but it, it really just helped me establish that I did want to go into this line of work. Yeah. No, that's good. Let's let's get a little deep into um, the like on the ground because several of you, you know, un, unprompted by me, made reference to the decade of centenaries as an example. Um, I think Jared, you'd mentioned it as like pr practitioner-led development, um, um, and David, you spoke about it as as well in in your line of work. So. I think it's important maybe to elaborate a little bit on this about the value of practitioners and what they can contribute to policy making. So I think we're agreed we're not discounting a third level education and, and peace and reconciliation studies, but um, the challenge of actually implementing this on, on the ground. So I'm trying to be constructive here about a recent, uh, our recent experience here in, in marking the decade of centenaries. So, um, Jared, first, if you want to go into into that. Aye, no problem. <clears throat> Look, I'm not discounting the whole degree that I did. You that know, was I was there for four years. <laughs> I did give it a bit, like, and and that value the work and the, some and a lot of the learning. But I suppose what you're referring to there is the ethical and shared remember, remembering practices or principles that were developed by our partners on the junction. Uh, so Maureen Hendon and Johnston McMaster in particular, who came up with a way of remembering, which and marking the, the decade, which wasn't triumphalist. It was also about remembering in context. It was about placing things um, in a way that we can remember the past, look at the past and examine it without having to be triumphalist about it, without scoring points over anybody else, and acknowledge where we've come from, but learn from it and move forward together. And they put that together in a whole theory. Um, it's a, robust theory, it's like we've put it into practice many times, and I think there's a number of public bodies as well that have used it as their guidelines whenever they were going to, and councils and others, that were going to look at how we mark these things so that we can do it in a way that's it's open and accessible and doesn't cause any more damage, because some of the things that were marked during the, and for probably still yet they happen, are possibly or potentially really divisive but if you do it following these 10 principles, um, then it's, it's a really valuable thing. And, and David, your, your ex experience um, and the opportunity, say, the decade of centenaries even offered you? Well, um, I suppose maybe just before I touch on the decade of centenary stuff, um, just to say, I, I haven't studied, formally studied peace, conflict, studies I haven't formally studied at in university. I did, a, I did a philosophy degree which was based on history of art, so to look at stained glass windows and stuff like that. But, um, uh, but what, I, what I would say, from my own personal 
journey and experience. One of the reasons why I came up here was to I wanted to understand Protestantism, Unionism, and Loyalism, and Orangeism, because I didn't know anything about it. And what I would say is that key to the work that I've been doing now for 25 years is relationships, trust, honesty, and delivery. And those four things are circular, because when you deliver, it cements the relationship, it builds greater trust. Uh, so whenever it came around to the time of, well, the stuff that I was doing in, 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 in the council, well, in, in Carimil, it started in Carimil, but then on to the council, around working on programs around cultural identity, particularly, and particularly working with people from unionist loyalist communities on cultural identity stuff, mainly around bonfires. We had a fantastic program around that. But whenever you're moving into a new project, be it the decade of centenaries, it's getting people involved because these things only happen when people make them happen and people engage in them and deliver, and, and deliver them. So we had a number of people through the relationships that had been developed over the years that you can, you can call up or you can call out to them and you can say, listen, this is where we're going with this. Are you up for it? Are you interested? And the question is, well, what's in it for us? And here's what's in it for you. It's about, it's about having the opportunity to commemorate, to uh, mark key events in the history, in our shared history, but marking them in a shared way. And, um, and the principles and the underpinning of the principles and the value of that, and I've talked, you know, CRC were instrumental in that, um, and Heritage Lottery as well, and the council. We, uh, once those principles can be agreed at a political level, which was the fantastic uh, success at the outset of the Decade of Centenaries, having those set of agreed principles meant that whenever an event was happening or an activity was coming up, so long as they're being run in accordance with those principles, it, it was easy because the agreement was reached at the outset. So you had 10 years of events and activities that were able to happen, that people were able to buy into because that security of those principles meant that things could happen uh, in a way that everybody was comfortable with. So fantastic work. And listening to like both of you, though, seems to, to me to be like a combination. So you've got practitioner-led theory, seriously, you're grounded and tested. But without the long-term relationships that you've established, you have the best practitioner-led theory in the world, but if you don't have the relationships on the ground... So, and I have a word for that. Yeah? Pracademics. Pracademics. You heard it here first. Pracademics. So pracademics. It means, you know, your academics, your academic stuff needs the practical stuff. Your practical stuff needs the academic input. And the Decade of Centenaries was the best example of pracademics. Excellent. Do you like that? That's very, very good. Right so, <laughs> last, last question for our, our guest here, and then we'll open up to the, to the floor. I just want to speak um, about young people. Um, so I'm, I've been living here for over 30 years, and I felt my age at the wake for the death of Lyra McKee, uh, the, the lawn of Belfast City Council. And I realized I was one of the older people in, in the audience, and I realized there was a new generation of young people with their own life experiences and expectations. And it just made me think about what's my responsibility now, um, what's our responsibility, what are, what are they saying? So I'd like to each of you just to make a remark just about your views on uh, how we um, complete the transition, uh, Michael, um, as you like to say, uh, we're still um, a society in conflict, just less violent, but we still need to address the conflict. Um, so I might start with you, you Michael. Uh, John, I think the terminology thoughts? that I use for a conflict that's in a transition. The conflict has been transfer transformed to be less violent. And when we talk about young people, one of the things that I have argued about from 1986, because that's when I took up the first post as a community relations officer, was to deal with sectarianism. And I have felt down through the years that we really, really have not touched sectarianism in a way that I feel would be more productive. I think we need to get the grips with the whole terminology. Sectarianism, I was asked one time, what is it anyhow? And I said, it's when you treat somebody less favorable than you would one of your own. And sometimes it's conscious, sometimes it's unconscious. The difficulty we have with it is that we don't understand why the Orange Order want to parade. 
and the Orange Order don't understand why people don't understand why they want a parade. And it's a, a confusion that's, that's out there as to why we allow parades to happen and why we don't allow parades to happen. And we need to look seriously behind that of why we've remained divided down through the years. And we have made many attempts at bringing young people away for weekends and they have a fun weekend, but they don't touch the hard stuff that needs to be touched because we need longer periods to do it. And short-term funding doesn't work. We need to be taking this more seriously. And I feel that our young people in schools could be doing more over a longer period of time. Yeah, Jared, you'd, you'd mentioned too about the programs, the good programs that are out there. Um, and yet young people, all of us living here, will grow up in our homes and... Uh, I think you used the, the phrase osmosis, learning. I do, do. I think the first thing they say, really, obviously, I'm sitting here at 50 years of age. I have no right to be talking about young people. But I think that within my role, one of the things that we can be doing, uh, myself and my colleagues here, is creating the conditions where young people feel as though they have a future here, where they can feel as though they've got a job, where they can feel as though society is less, less structurally divided. Yes, until we change those structural challenges, we are always going to be, or not always, the majority of us are going to live in single identity communities. We're going to go to uh, faith-based schools We're going to, that are divided, the majority of us. And these things are not healthy. So I think we need to have a bigger conversation to say, what's the ambition for this place? We need to be really ambitious for those that are coming behind us. We run programs, uh, my colleague Fiona and myself, on it's called the Future Leaders Programme. One of the challenges, when we look around within the community and voluntary sector, it's nuts, but we're still some of the youngest people in the room whenever we go to meetings, and I'm 50, and I'm not giving her age away. Um, and that's not right. You know, the succession planning hasn't happened. There's still a lot of political control within community organisations and within local communities. The level of gatekeeping is still atrocious. And we need to get beyond that. We need to say to people, there's a better way here. And whenever we become more prosperous, when we become uh, better connected than we have been, that's when we'll start to see change. We can deal with attitudinal change as much as we can, but whenever people are going on the homes and going on the communities that are still divided, that's really difficult. It's difficult for them to stand up, put their head above the parapet and say, I want this to be different, because we haven't known different here for so long, and we need that to change. Dipna, I know you're very passionate about these things as, as well. Would you like to share your thoughts about a, a vision for, for, for us? Yeah, well, we had a whole razzmatazz last year, about the 25 years after the Good Friday Agreement. And if you consider society back then, it looks very different now, thankfully. And I think a society of progress and peace where you have minority ethnic community growth, um, you have the LGBTQI+. Plus, um, society or community, you know, more visible, pride parade. You have um, women's groups that are much stronger and out demanding their rights and so on and so on. So it's a, a different society we're living in now, but it's the same. The George right, the segregation, the flags, the interface barriers, the uh, paramilitary control in areas, etc., etc. still ongoing. And as far as young people are concerned, we're doing a lot of work with them. And they, they first of all, may not see it relevant to themselves until, until they start exploring how it's impacted on them. You know, people say they weren't born in the Troubles, they were born after uh, the ceasefires and after the Good Friday Agreement. But they still live with the legacy we're handing on to them, older people. And we have a responsibility to undo that for them. And we also have a responsibility to look to what society will look like now, 25 years after. I was very disappointed after the, the whole Good Friday Agreement, um, razzmatazz, I call it, where the great and the good from all over the world came and clapped themselves in the back, rightfully. It, I'm not saying it, it wasn't a good thing. It put us on the track. But what I had expected was at the end of it that say, well, finish the job. Bill Clinton said that when he went to Derry that time. Many years ago was that? 95, yeah. No, it was 2005. What, well, 2005, yeah. But finish the job. The job needs finished. You see young people from minority ethnic communities living in single identity areas. So they're going to be going to 
potentially single identity schools, knocking about with groups from one religion. That's not a healthy society. And it's not a healthy society that children are still living behind barriers, segregated from a community on the other side. Do you know, I was looking up incidents recently on interfaces, and the last ones registered were Lanark Way and The Fountain, and it's a couple of years ago. So we've over 100, believe it or not. They were supposed to all be down by last year. What happened there? 2023, the commitment from government was that all interface barriers would be down, be gone, and they're not. There's actually more than when the Good Friday Agreement was signed. So for our young people, they deserve better, they want better. When you start talking to them, I mean, the, the, Michael's writing the terminology, you need to be saying to them, you know, do you want this to stay? Because the other thing is that interface communities, single identity communities are the, the most, the worst off, the, the highest levels of poverty, lowest levels of um, educational attainment, high uh, poor health, et cetera, et cetera. They suffer the most. And that's been the same for the past 50 years, not 25. The same top 10 just swap around places from five to six or nine to eight, but they stay the same. And they're all uh, interface areas. They're all single identity areas. That's inequality and that's a breach of their human rights. We we'll have to change that. And for, I think you need to get young people on track to say, here's why, because you're being disadvantaged here. Who's going to invest in these areas? How is it going to change? What are you hoping for for the future? They need a dream. They need to be put on the right track. And we need to be producing young people who say, we're proud of this place. We're, we're the peace ambassadors. And we bring young people from all over the world here to talk about peace processes in their countries. And we should be setting our young people over to other countries as well, saying, look what we've achieved. So, yeah, that's what I want. I want the new society to be focusing on the future and addressing the legacy of the past, which is still impacting on them. And us older people have a responsibility to make sure it happens. So, David, I'll give you the final word before we open up. Is um, I, I was struck by some of your remarks about a genuine reconciliation process and and how how to achieve peace, like true peace. <laughs> um, so, you know, give us some give us some hope. Uh, gosh. Well, I remember one time having a conversation with uh, with Colin Craig, who was the director of Carmel at the time, and he said to me, where do you see the word peace most? And he says, in the graveyard, at peace. <laughs> I thought that was an interesting one. Um, what Dimpna said there, uh, and what Jared was saying as well, I think is really important. We still live in a divided society, a segregated society, where those who suffered most during the conflict consider, con continue to suffer most during a time of peace. And the closer you live to an interface barrier or a peace wall, the more socially disadvantaged, educationally disadvantaged, poorer health you have. And it is an equality issue, and we need to start looking at it as an equality issue. Um, when, I, when, I, when I'm engaging with young people through my work, um, one of the things that I uh, find at the moment is aspiration and, reach and, 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 and potential. So, and it's a bit like what Jared said about how do we encourage people to stay here? Um, and I remember somebody tell me one time they, 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 they look, they're very good at maths and they, they were looking to maybe go into somewhere like Queen's to do accounting, but, but that's not a place where people from my community go. Um, and I found that very, uh, very sort of sad to hear. And then, but all of the big banks are over there in that, that part of the city and I probably wouldn't feel safe going there. So for me, community relations, I suppose, shifted a little bit in my head that it's not necessarily about, because this young person, she hadn't a bigoted bone in her body. She didn't display any sort of form of prejudice or sectarianism or anything like that. But she felt that there were barriers to her achieving her potential and, and her aspirations for, for herself and her future and her interests. So I was sort of, you know, how do we address that? And it's simply about bringing people on a journey helping people to build relationships to, do, to dispel those fears, those, those perceptions that they may have. And, that, and that's what led me into this whole you know, area of, we, we haven't had a proper conversation in this place about reconciliation, I don't think. And one of the challenges for all of us, and, and in fairness to our new First and Deputy First Ministers, I think they've done a really fantastic job in setting the tone around how they want to be with each other and that example to us to be with each other. 
Um, and how do we build on that by creating some sort of a societal agreement about what needs to be done in terms of reconciliation? And for me, I think um, it's about me. It's not about me saying, well, if you do this, we'll be friends. Or if you stop doing that, we'll be... It's about, well, what do I need to do to improve my attitudes? What do I need to do to change my attitudes? And then I bring it back to relationships, uh, trust, honesty. They're the things I think that can help build a genuine, true reconciliation. Because it's not, it shouldn't, reconciliation isn't a political project. Reconciliation needs to be a human project where we engage with each other in a genuine way. And I think when things like that happen, it opens up those opportunities for young people. Because the reality is, we still have a distinct set of cultural identities within this society that continue to cause challenges. And Michael has touched, or touched on it a lot in terms of talking about his, his work <coughs> dealing with um, parade and protests. Uh, so, so we still have those. How can we be generous? How can we be more generous? to other people's cultural identity? How can we engage with different cultural identities that are different than my own? And I go back to, I suppose, that's partly why I ended up here <laughs> 27 years ago, because I wanted to find out. I was curious, and maybe that's easy for someone like me and probably a bit naive, someone for me, like have not having lived, because I know how people feel about maybe walking down certain streets because of maybe experiences that have happened uh, or that they remember from when they were young or whatever. So I'm not, I would never tell anybody uh, that, that that's what anybody should do. But I suppose for me, it's about looking at myself and going, what can I do to make uh, relationships with people who from a different cultural identity than mine better? I was going to say, to be fair to yourself, that's what you do. You help others who um, want to go on that, on that journey. Yeah. Well, I'd like to open up to the, to the floor. I hope I can see your hands. Um, I will ask one of my volunteers, uh, Ewan, thanks, to take lift one of these mics. And um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Ewan. And with anyone, anyone on the floor would like to present a, a question to any of our guests about any of their practical work. Their so yes, yes, Margaret. Um, it's generally reckoned that our divided society costs about a billion pounds a year, and if something could be done to integrate us more, the integrated education has just lost 150 million pounds for developing the schools, um, and there's very little seems to be done about integrated housing. Um, how can we speed things up so that those integration projects are really worthwhile and have an effect? I think you heard the, the question, I don't know if it was picked up on the mics, but just about the cost of segregation and, and um, you know, how to speed up things to make it better. I think we need to stop talking about changing it towards an integrated society. This place just needs to work better. You, you can't have four different sets of or types of educational process and expect to get uh, economies of scale, etc. Our public services need entirely redrawn, redrafted. We need to deal with waiting lists, we need to deal with what really matters to people. I think we should just have an education system that should deal with everybody. And it just so happens that if you're dealing with everybody, it's automatically integrated. I, th I think we just need to change how we do things completely, structurally, and make it common sense. It, it's like that billion pound a year how could we better spend a billion pound a year? You know, I'm pretty sure there's other ways. And I'm, uh, I don't know, I'm also pretty sure that one of the ways we could do it is look at the role of civil service and streamlining what they do. Yeah, there's um, a draft, um, People, Planet and Prosperity uh, programme for government plan. So what we've done, we've been working with the, the, the voluntary and community sector and the civil society at large, asking what their views are and what they want for the future and integrated education and um, shared housing and bringing down flags and doing away with the uh, interface walls and dealing with paramilitaries. All those issues come up um, and others. And basically what we're suggesting is that there should be a fourth pillar within the programme for government and it should be peace, just to fit in with the P, so we said a peace pillar. 
And if it's not a pillar, it should be an underpinning foundation for the programme for government. Because if you don't have policy that says we're going to do A, B and C, no funding follows, no commitment. Um, so it needs to be written in to government policy, is my view. Um, and also we have a review at the moment of the, the current programme, that's our reconciliation programme called Together Building a United Community. I have a big thing about this, I think. It's just called a peace plan. We've called it all sorts of things, and this is the latest. Who would remember that? Um, it's being reviewed, and I think it's very important, again, that we highlight that so we talked about sectarianism. For me, it's down to segregation now, because within those communities, you have uh, paramilitary groups, dissidents, and UVF, UDA. There's very little cross-community uh, violence anymore. Communities are terrorised by their own paramilitaries, and that needs to be addressed. And in relation to shared education, how can young people go to an integrated education and then be sent back into those communities and get the support? It's very difficult for them. All the schools need to be integrated so they're not having to cross divides and the, the, the communities they go back to are integrated as well. So I say, I'm a policy nerd, get it written into policy, lobby and lobby and lobby, programme for government, TBOC, all the other strategies, education strategy, young people strategy, get it all around segregation, integration. Yeah, like, sort of looking at this myself, whenever the Secretary of State um, said that we needed to cut about 850 million uh, from our budget in order to balance the books, my, is, my instinctive response was, well, that's easy. We just dismantle segregation and we could potentially save about 850 million quid <laughs> because we, you know, if, if, if you, there's, there's, a, there's a 2016 Ulster University study on the costs of division, which I've, I've, I've look, looked at and referred to a number of times. And it compares Belfast or compares Northern Ireland to um, Merseyside as a comparable place in terms of population, social de social issues, or whatever. But, one, but it says a number of things. It says we spend about two hundred and twenty-seven million pounds more policing us here than they do in Merseyside. It says we spend uh, the integrated education um, fund recent re report last year said we spend about six hundred uh, six hundred million pounds a year more on servicing a segregated education system. And a part of the issue is that for 40 years we, 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 we had a public uh, service policy and policy model of duplication in order to ensure that people using services felt safe. So for instance the transport system uh, all congregated in on the city centre. Uh, only since the glider came about could you get a bus from West Belfast to East Belfast. Up until then you couldn't. All of the transport system, all, everything comes into the city centre. And when you think about it, and particularly when we go back to the question about young people, young people are interested in the environment and climate more so than maybe any other generation. And when you think about stuff like that, when you think about congestion, when you think about the fact that um, we, we bus young people roughly, according to the Ulster University report, 130 million miles a year to work or to school, we bust them because they don't go to their closest school. It's back to the point about a single education model. But how do you dismantle segregation? Dismantling segregation requires services to be used and the differences between communities haven't become irrelevant. That's what people around Orkin and Peace Walls always said, that the wall will come down whenever it no longer needs to be there. And why, when will it not need to be there? When people feel safe, when people feel secure, when people have those social and economic issues addressed from, a point, from an equality standpoint, and when people feel that they can connect other parts of the city, when people feel that they can be mobile, when people can fulfil their aspirations and potential. So that's, and that's about building relationships between people from different cultural identities. But I'll leave it at yeah. There's, a lot, there's an awful lot of statistics. That, that also university report is very good. It talks about, it even says something along the lines of if we had the same representation as they do in Scotland, we could save 6.6 .6 million a year in terms of their MSPs and their. But it also talks about leisure provision, community provision, health, um, and a lot of the conflict related costs, though, 
they, they, they can't be wiped away overnight because there is a specific need as a result of the conflict that people who fund this place need to face up to as well. So, but some of the things like leisure provision, education, um, you can build relationships through dismantle and segregation to accelerate that process of building a better society. And Margaret, I wasn't planning on answering questions, but um, when Dipna spoke about the program for government um, at Shared Future News, we're exploring, um, there are many others exploring this as well, this idea of a positive peace. Um, so there's an Institute for uh, Economics and Peace based in Australia. And so everyone's familiar with the negative piece of the absence of violence, but what does a positive piece look like? And so this institute has is, is developed a model looking at uh, uh, data, uh, different uh, indicators. And so at Shared Future News, we're interested in developing a positive peace index for Northern Ireland. So there's the, I, the Institute have positive peace indexes for Southern Ireland and for the UK, uh, but not specifically for Northern Ireland. So Dipna has referred to that, and there are, there are others looking at this. So, but it's just something that I think, in my opinion, uh, would be useful is for, for both the politicians and the policymakers to actually say, well, what, 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 are the, what does the data say? And that includes things like attitudes as well and segregation. So it's to try to kind of embed some of this objective uh, uh, evidence into policymaking, one of your, one of your favorites. Any, any other questions? Oh, now they're coming up. So, um, which is fine. Um, I'm just conscious we're live streamed on YouTube, so hopefully they'll keep us rolling. But I'm more than happy to keep taking questions. If who has the microphone? Ewan? There, no, Ewan's just there. Um, so, uh, Ewan, we'll start with the gentleman in the front here in the, in the gray jacket, please. I, uh, I just wondered what happened to the intercultural relations, um, the intercultural law that they were working on a few years ago. I was working on it with a girl called Charo. Don't know if you've heard of that. Intercultural relations, and they, they wrote all the law, and they published it, but they never acted on it. It's all about bringing people together from different backgrounds, different international... Yeah. <laughs> Are you referring to the racial equality strategy? No, no, it was no. The intercultural relations. That's what the name of the for, project for was. For Northern Ireland? Within Northern yeah. Ireland or was it UK? Yeah, North, Northern Ireland. It was a specific project. The girl's name was Charo. She came from Chile. She travels the world delivering this program now. Charo, yeah, yeah. you know Charo? I, I know Charo, yeah. 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 Um, so that Charo's was something, working on this. yeah, so that was a girl that was, that started that whole ball rolling, all about intercultural relations, so looking at the different things yes. that divided people and what would bring them together and get them working together through all of the successful stuff that's already been worked on. Yeah. Since the uh, re-imaging communities, re-imaging murals, bring the walls down, Northern Ireland connections, golden bridges. It was the build on all of that. Yeah. But what ha what's happened? Yeah? I'm People not are sure not talking familiar to with each Charo's other. work. Yeah? Um, she's been doing a lot of training for many years, yeah. raising cultural awareness and so now she bringing does people it together. Globally, because she was getting nowhere here. Yeah. So almost, I'll, I'll follow up on that. To so yeah, if I can Charo's find the book, culture. I'll give you a he copy does, of yes, it. Please. Yeah. yeah. There it's was. a very interesting, yeah. Well, thank you, sorry. So there was someone, I think, uh, right next to you. Yeah. Sorry, if you just hand the right. microphone to <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering, how do you guys involve youth, uh, even when they don't see the impact the conflict had on them? Um, in Hollywell Trust, we don't work directly with youth because there's a number of organisations already do and do it a lot better. Uh, so we leave it to the experts at engaging young people. Um, but I think the youth voice is crucial and critical as we move forward. Um, Dominic, you and I talk about the, the, the Peace Summit and the involvement. Yeah, we've been involved for the past two years in a, a Peace Summit. After the Good Friday Agreement, we decided that we would not consider, the, but 25 years later, we'd take a, a temperature check on where we're at 
you know, in relation to community relations and race relations. Um, and we did a programme, a parallel programme with practitioners and civil society and young people. So we joined with the uh, Ulster University and Youth Action and other youth groups. And they did uh, a, th a programme, Jared, remind me what it was, uh, Hunger Games. Are you familiar with the Hunger Games? I'm a fan. The, you're a fan, <laughs> good. You'll know what it is. I don't know what it is. <laughs> the young people did it. But the Hunger Games, it was a whole process. They engaged about 500 young people. They called it the Hunger for Peace. So my understanding of it is rather than fight to the death, they fought for the, for the peace. Would that mm -hmm. be, yeah? So they got the young people engaged loosely yeah, um, uh, in this program to, to find different ways that, that we were going to conferences and training sessions and seminars, but young people wanted something different, something active. And they did that, uh, as I say, across the region and cross border. Um, so to follow up on that, they said to the young people that they wouldn't just leave it at that, get their views and move on, which often happens. Um, we're having a, a peace summit for youth uh, next month it will be um, with Candice Mama. Have you heard of Candice Mama? She's a, a young South African woman. She's an influencer and a model and uh, quite well known and a peace advocate. Her father was murdered in South Africa and she's taken on the, the idea of peace and reconciliation. Um, and she's going to be the keynote speaker and uh, coming along to that. It's going to be in Derry and the, the date Jared remind me of the date, but we'll, we'll go through Alan if you're on the, on the website for Shared News, Shared Future News. Um, we'll, you'll be able to promote it for us, yeah. Uh, and is that, is that kind of following all for One World Youth? No, it's, it's entirely different, and it, it's focusing on here uh, specifically. Um, after that, we'll look beyond, but we wanted to take a temperature check of where we, what we need to do here next. And uh, we're bringing together the young people for a peace summit in McGee University. I think that one was something to do with that one world youth, the South African. Oh, she may have been. She, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure she was. Sorry, yeah, I thought That's you meant the one that came here. Yeah, yeah no, no, no she's doubt. She's following on from the one Yeah, world the powerful speaker. Michael, could you? No, I particularly don't work directly with young people now. But there was a time when I, all my work was with young people. But what we did in the earlier days, we got a book called, it was written by a lady called Mary Fitzduff. It's called Community Conflict Skills. And there were four of us sat down and we designed the first community relations training program. And it was bringing youth workers on board, showing them how to do work with young people. And from that, developed a whole lot of different programs. And what we did was we put 12 youth leaders together Brought them, broke them up on these sets. We gave them different programs to go out over a couple of months period and deliver them. And then come back into another bigger set to talk about what was working. And from that we started developing types of programs to do with young people. But it has got into a whole different ball game now with different methods and different technology that's used. Now the nearest centre in the city, in our city, have a lot of video games and a lot of videos. I remember the first one that I ever used was a video that was done on the Battle of the Saw, as well as the Easter Rising. And it was a great tool they put in your toolbox. And I myself have written four different training manuals for, for community workers. The last one was Peace Builders for the World Market. So that, that's how I started working it. Now what happened for me was I began to get too old to work to like it with young people, so I stopped it. And I felt that it would be better working with the older age groups. Oh, it's a very, very important question because um, we always talk about, and we've all, we've all talked about here as well, about the future and, 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 and young people and so on. So I suppose the very first thing you said when you started tonight was, I'm going to move from the far right to the far left. And I thought that was a political statement. <laughs> and one of the things about the world we live in is that it is becoming more and more polarised um, from the far right to the far left. Um, and and I see a lot of the work that we do with young people. I think what we're trying to do here in this in this place is actually something totally different. We're trying to bring different political, diverse uh, views and positions to work together. 
Whereas in many countries across the world, you have this sort of exclusion, exclusionism in terms of in terms of where in terms of society. So I think here it's very, it's quite, it's quite important and it's quite unique at the moment. A lot of the work with young people, because my my I have a nineteen year old son, so he he the, the troubles and the conflict is in history books in school. People are studying it in school. Um, People here have talked to you tonight about how they lived it. Um, so people are studying it in school. So, so the, it, the, the troubles and the conflict, you could say, is history. But the legacies of that is not. So young people, the legacies of conflict mean that the closer you live to a peace wall or an interface barrier, the less likely you are to achieve educationally, the more economically disadvantaged you're going to be and a whole raft of health issues. People now talk, also talk about this thing called transgenerational trauma, whereby the, the, the environment of conflict um, and the, the, the impact of that on future generations. But a lot of the work with young people is around um, tackling prejudice. It's around getting people to engage with people from a different cultural identity, background to them. Um, and one of the things that was said by uh, uh, by Jared earlier on was about you know the community you go back to and the school you go back to you know whenever you've had sort of these these good positive experiences, and I was up with a with a group last week, um, our city youth who work out at the Huben Centre, and all of their work is geared around and that's on the Peace Wall. It's a shared space between the Woodvale and Ardoyne. You're nodding because obviously you know what I'm talking about. It's a fantastic place. Mm -hmm. But the work that they do is not just about the young people. It's about the family. It's about the community. And it's about everybody. So it's not just about people having an experience. It's about the community experience of community relations and getting to know each other and all of that sort of stuff as well. The stuff that's happening in schools, there's a lot of really good stuff happening in schools through the Education Authority's Shared Education Programme and their shared education. Now, it's not integrated education, it's shared education. But again, we, we've, we've been doing some great stuff with, with a number of schools, particularly in South and West Belfast recently, primary schools, getting young people to just simply uh, engage with the positiveness of difference. And so those experiences are really important. Engage in the positiveness of different. Sorry, you you coughing to shut no, me up, or are you no, really coughing? Because I really am coughing. But um, you're holding the microphone purposefully. But I know there was someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll give it to him. Uh, behind, thanks. <laughs> and did you want to ask a question, or no? Great. So you have the last question, okay. please. Um, oh, so, sorry. Did you? So okay. Yes. Go ahead. Um, sorry. Um, you mentioned earlier on, Dominic, about you know, 25 years on from the Good Friday Agreement, and there being you know more interfaces and more peace walls and things than there were before. And you said earlier on about sort of you know the troubles being in a history book, but still being sort of very prevalent. So what I'm sort of wondering is, in terms of say like the work of yourselves and sort of that I don't know civic leadership, that civic society work. When like when's the work done? Like, how long should it take for the peace building to actually finish? And then what does that look like? I think the work will finish whenever we know we're not a threat to the other side, and the other side now feeling it's threatened by us. It's as simple as that. And that could be generations away. 25 years on from a Good Friday Agreement doesn't say that the conflict's over. Maybe 25 years on from a conflict, we're still living in it living with the conflict and the only thing that really has happened is we have transformed it to be less violent but we will know when it's over whenever we're not a threat to each other Dear oh my God. Um, I, th I think part of the challenge that we need to look at is it's partly the structural conversation I think we need to recognise the class issue that's involved in our conflict um, I think we need to look at the long-term um, sectarian decisions that were taken. They disinvest in a number of areas as well. I think when we can see everybody having the opportunity to prosper is one of the ways that we'll know. Um, and when our politics become normal, when our politics are based on policy, as Dampner has referred to, and it's based on 
what your political attitude is rather than your identity and, and what your position is on a constitutional question. I think we need to be generous with one another and to get to a place where we can have those difficult conversations and recognise that we need to be in a position where we feel comfortable with having those conversations. Otherwise, the constitutional stuff that's come in the border poll that might come down the line is, could be uh, further divisive rather than, if you like, settling the peace. It's like we do a project at the minute called the Future Relationship Conversations Project that looks exactly at that, taking some of the learning from Brexit when everybody liked this and says, look, there's a really important vote and the vote was really black and white or it appeared so without anybody actually considering what the options were. We need to be in a position where we give people the opportunity, if they so want, to base that decision on whether or not this is an all Ireland or whatever it is, based on fact. If they want to then choose simply based on identity, that's up to the person. But I think part of our role as peace builders, to give us that term, um, is that we need to have the open conversation. We need to be providing people with that fact-based stuff to say, look, here's the reality of the future. The future, but I do think that dealing with some of the class issues and stuff, the long-term unemployment, the disinvestment, the I think one of the most important strategies that we're about to see is the anti-poverty strategy. That is the thing that can actually change this place rather than the, the good relations strategy that they're working on. Her, her hang on, Dipna. So I want to get uh, just time we're well over time. So I'll get you okay, John? You we'll speak afterwards. But go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I know while there were speakers, I was thinking about it, and I, I think the important thing is that we need to have a vision first. There needs to be an end game to know when we're going to finish. You know, at the moment, there's no vision to say, like there had been a vision, as I said, in 2023, they're supposed to have all the interfaces down, which they didn't. But there needs to be a vision to say, this is a society that has changed. Here's where we hope to go, get to. This is what we want it to look like. And it needs to be a societal contribution to that, to talk about where we want to go and how we're going to get there. I have really great faith in the people here. I've worked in the community for over 45 years. And I've found people in areas that are worst affected and of everyone else, that if you say to them, let's take the wall down, for example, or the flags, they'll say, no, that's a bit afraid. What about your children and your grandchildren? Get them down, get the schools integrated, get the housing integrated, let them go and be with whoever they want, marry whoever they want, socialise where they want, live where they want. There's a whole mindset when they've been allowed the opportunity to speak. But the vision needs to be there, it needs to, and the commitment from government needs to be there to actually achieve that vision. And it's back to my point about the programme for government and other uh, policies and strategies that need to have a vision and people need to be involved in that vision. And so therefore, in answer to your question, the long way around, I find it very difficult to, to know that without that vision existing. You know, um, we could maybe put time scale on, but peace is fragile. You know, war is quite easy. That, that sounds terrible. Peace isn't. Peace is hard. It's cheaper, but it's harder because there's a lot of warmongers about and there's a lot of people who benefit from violence. But it's harder for peace and sometimes there's a reluctance to get integration and to have that vision that we all know what it should look like. Um, so, yeah, I, I want the vision and then I'll be able to tell you how long, but I think it's an ongoing thing, particularly when it's a change in society in terms of multiculturalism and everyone else, minority groups and marginalised groups coming to the fore. But give us the vision. I'll give you a very quick answer. Uh, when, when nobody feels that they have any barriers to their potential and aspiration based on their political, cultural, religious, or ethnic background, when people feel that they can go where they want, do what they want, be who they want, without those chains of their identity, being divisive, then we'll be in a really good place. Thanks very much. Hang on, don't I? No. 
that's, uh, I think, a great, great way to end this conversation. Thanks for your patience. We went a little long there, but I uh, hope you agree that it was worth it. Um, I'm very thankful to our guests very much for joining us. I also wish to thank our volunteers, Mackin, Ewan, and Kiva, who are silently there in the background, uh, keeping, the sh keeping the show together. I want to thank the uh, Accidental Theatre here, and this venue, uh, the front door crew, and the, pe the people in the tech room, uh, making sure all the mics and the videos are all working. Um, I want to thank our artist, Brian John Spencer, um, who has been working in the background drawing some illustrations of us. Um, and finally, I wish to thank all of you very much for coming out this evening and giving us your time, and I hope you found this uh, a worthwhile experience. Thanks very much. Thank you.